Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael Duffy from Time Magazine, and I welcome you all to the What If session, What If Robots Went to War. Now, that title is a little unweffy. Uh, it's not uh, something you've seen before, really, in a, in a forum uh, setting like this. And it brings, it sounds a little bit more like something out of Star Wars than out of Davos. Um, it raises the specter, I think, in some people's heads of giant clone armies amassing on large battlefields uh, for final uh, uh, conquests, and it's, what we're going to talk about today is something a little more complicated, uh, a little more challenging, uh, and perhaps much closer than many people realize. Um, and that's why we're here today. It's also part of a uh, series at uh, Davos this year that the Forum and Time Magazine are cooperating on that we call What If, uh, that looks, tries to get past today's headline, past this week's crisis, uh, and beyond perhaps for both governments and businesses uh, the challenge of meeting the quarter, to try to f sort of uh, invite uh, all kinds of uh, people to look well beyond the year, to consider possibilities, good and bad, black swans, white swans, things that we haven't had a chance to think about, haven't had a chance to contemplate, uh, that might actually occur uh, in a time frame that would surprise you. Uh, some of the other ones uh, that are being discussed this week here at Davos are what if uh, uh, a lot of people started living to 150? What would that mean? There was an, uh, another one tomorrow, uh, co-hosted by Rana Faruhar, my colleague at Time. Essentially, that asked the question, what if your brain could confess your sins? Hmm. That comes out of, that's a, uh, these are all tied together, as you can see, living to 100 robot armies' brains. Anyway, so uh, uh, these are a kind of a new sort of focus and framework uh, for some of the sessions here. And we think they're going to be provocative and interesting. We've also uh, twinned these conversations with a poll that I invite you to take now. You can log on to wef.ch slash vote. And can, there are three questions we're asking today here in the room. We invite you to do that. Leave your browser open, uh, and it will refresh with the other two questions. We've uh, pulled these questions online for the last week to 10 days uh, at time. And so we have results from beyond this room, and we're hoping to get your thoughts about the questions from here in the room. Uh, so while you do that, uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, fab fantastic panel um, uh, today to talk about essentially autonomous weapons. Um, and I want to say something, by the way. Uh, I'm going to ask each of them uh, a very broad uh, opening question, but that are kind of joint opening statements so we can move to issues quickly. Um, so Raja Kar uh, is the chairman of British Aerospace uh, and has been, uh, which is one of, the, in terms of global reach and influence, um, one of the most important defense contractors in the world and has been for a long time. Uh, Angela Kane has been in uh, conflict resolution for the UN and other NGOs for several decades. And she's now a senior fellow at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. Stuart Russell is at UCAL Berkeley. He is a professor of computer science and is one of the leading spokesmen in the field of trying to limit these weapons and their uh, use. And of course, Paul Winfield um, is at the Bristol Robotics Alan. Lab. <laughs> that Alan right? Winfield. Um, Alan Winfield, excuse me, is at the Bristol Robotics Lab uh, uh, in, the, in the University of West England. So, um, and uh, we're glad to have them all today. We look forward to a good conversation, and we'll take some questions uh, in, the, in the after part of this. Um, I want to start uh, with Stuart. Um, you have been outspoken in the last year uh, about these weapons, as they, and, and something has hastened your concern uh, in the uh, AI field. So could you talk a little bit about um, uh, how that has taken place? Uh, sure. So I think, actually, I should apologize on behalf of the AI community for not addressing this issue much sooner. Uh, I think if we had started to understand 10 years ago uh, where things were going, uh, we could have avoided uh, a situation where we may be uh, heading into a very undesirable arms race. Uh, so a couple of years ago, the United Nations uh, started to take seriously the possibility that we would have autonomous weapons, uh, which means uh, very precisely weapons that can locate and attack targets without human intervention. Uh, so I want to be very clear that we're not talking about drones, where a human pilot is controlling the drone, is looking through the camera, uh, and is choosing when to fire the missile. Uh, so, so those are off the table. Uh, and, well, I should say they're already on the table in their millions, and there's nothing we can do about that. Mm -hmm. um, so 
the first question that occurred to everybody in this debate, which the UN began and has held several sessions in Geneva uh, to try and understand what to do, the first question is, uh, can these weapons, if they are making decisions on who to kill, uh, can they follow the laws of war? Uh, and the laws of war are quite difficult even for uh, human commanders and soldiers to follow. Uh, they involve making sure that you're not attacking uh, civilians, that there is military necessity for the attack. Uh, for example, we're not allowed to shoot at pilots who are bailing out of an aircraft on a parachute. Um, so there are many rules about uh, engagement that are quite complicated. Proportionality. Is the risk of collateral damage uh, proportional or reasonable uh, given the value of the target that you're trying to destroy. So these are very difficult things for AI systems to, to work out. Uh, the task of actually finding people and killing them is relatively straightforward in comparison. So that's the first set of debates that have been going on. The second question that comes up is a, is a strategic one. Um, and we have to get away from the idea that, well, instead of having a human soldier or a human drone pilot, we're just going to have a, an AI system doing the same thing and perhaps eventually doing it better. And wouldn't that be great because then human soldiers don't have to die? That's an extremely naive uh, set of questions to ask. <clears throat> it's sort of like saying that you know, if we replace spears with cruise missiles, that we'll use the cruise missiles in just the same situations that we would use the spears. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, and the characteristic, the defining characteristic of autonomy is not so much that uh, you don't have to put your soldiers at risk uh, and so on. It's that you don't need a human being to carry and direct the attack. So a million machine guns can wipe out everyone in New York City, but only if you have a million soldiers to carry them and five million human beings to support those soldiers and a whole nation state to pay for all that. Uh, but a million autonomous weapons needs only one person to launch them. Uh, and I hate to be geeky, but you just write, you know, for i equals one to a million do. That's a little piece of code for those of you who are not coders. Uh, and off the machines go and do their stuff. Uh, and do we really want to put the power to wipe out everyone in New York City in the hands of individuals who just need to be able to afford to buy those weapons? They don't need to be a nation. Uh, they don't need to have political support. They don't need to be part of the international system. They don't need to be subject to sanctions uh, and so on. So from a strategic point of view, I think this could be an extremely bad idea. So those two considerations, humanitarian and strategic, led uh, us, that means uh, the AI community, to come together and over 3,000 scientists and engineers in the AI community wrote an open letter in July saying that we really need to have a treaty banning these weapons. Thank you. Um, and we're going to come back to the treaty and how a ban might work uh, uh, in a minute. Uh, Sir Roger, uh, talk to us a little bit about how you see the, the technical and other opportunities and challenges in this space. Well, I think the starting point in, in answering the exam question uh, about robots is the definition of the robot that you've just given is the extreme version. And there are two layers before you get to the extreme. There's the quite simple robot, which is used in warfare today, that does the dirty jobs, you know, that looks for mines, you know, that gets involved in firefighting, that keeps people out of harm's way. And I don't think anybody would object to that. That's a sensible use of technology. The second layer, I think, is, is a little more complicated, where the technology is much more sophisticated, the use of sensors, algorithms, decision-making capability, and learning capability are embedded in the device. But the linkage is still back to the human being. And that, I think, takes some of the burden of decision-making away, you know, through the assimilation of data and the ability to understand the theatre of war, without removing the responsibility from an individual, you know, the person that actually decides to finally deploy the weapon. And I think that is very important. And you know, my own judgment is that that is the use of technology without straying into areas where, on an ethical basis and a moral basis, you would find difficulty in operating. If you have the man through the umbilical cord linked to the machine, then the man is still bound by the conventions of war. I mean, whether it's the Hague Convention or Geneva Convention, 
And if that man does something wrong, there's an audit trail, there's a responsibility. You know, there is no anonymity when a person presses the button. That level of sophistication is developing now. It is available more and more, certainly in aircraft. It's available in air-to-air -air missile activity. And again, it removes some of the risk, but it doesn't take away or absolve the individual from responsibility. The, 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 the final level, the fully autonomous machine, I think is a, a very difficult area. Something that can decide what its target is, how to address it, adjust its behavior, and deploy the weapon without any human intervention is taking this to another level. And I think what that does is place the AI weapon in an area that becomes completely devoid of a sense of responsibility. It's removed from any sense of ethical or moral concern. It, it actually finds difficulty in discrimination and actually observing the basic rules of war that exist and are clearly broken by human beings but exist as a framework is something that a machine can do with no emotion and no concern and no sense of mercy or discrimination or even identification of what is friend or foe. And I think from a technology point of view, and there are people here that, that know much more about the depth of technology than I, we still have some way to go before we could produce a machine, although there are 40 countries working at it now, and the potential of a $20 billion market in a few years' time. Although people are working at it now, I believe there's some way to go before anyone would believe we have a fully automated weapon carrier that we could deploy with confidence of no technical risk and reduced moral concern. Maybe we can come back to the timetable um, in, a, in, a, in the next round. Angela, uh, talk to us a little bit about how the international community, is it properly configured um, to either ban or regulate this, or just manage this kind of conflict were it ever to come to pass? Well, I think that um, Stuart has already spoken about the international uh, initiation of this right. debate. Now, I must tell you that I find that it came too late. It really is still too late behind it. And that is also true because you have a very glacial pace of international negotiations, and they haven't even really started. And I remember there was the uh, special rapporteur of the Human Rights Commission on, and I have to kind of look that I don't get the title wrong, on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions. Executions is the word here. And he put out a report in 2014, 2013, about this issue, which was very comprehensive. And I, at the time, was Under Secretary General and High Representative for uh, Disarmament. And I tried to get member states involved in this just to say, you must really look at this question because the technological developments, AI, robotics, are so fast, it's overtaken us by events. And the pace of looking at this issue in terms of international law is far behind. It. And the time was not ripe for it. The first time that member states really met, and that is in a under a convention that is called on, 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 on certain conventional uh, weapons, the so-called CCW, they met. But of course, the CCW only has two thirds of the membership of the United Nations. And what happens is that there are many countries and many representatives in the international community that don't really understand what is involved. They don't have this development. I mean, this development is something that's limited mm -hmm. to a number of advanced countries, and they're going ahead with it. But what is very concerning is what needs to be understood is exactly what both of you already mentioned, and that is that the conduct of war might be relegated to a machine. And I find that it really started with the drones. The drones were used initially only for surveillance. Now they used for a lot of other purposes. And that is something that has expanded very rapidly in a very small number of years. And so the concern that was raised in this letter that, that the community published in July was very, very well taken. But the monopoly of the conduct of war is really being taken out of the hands of, of, of humans, or could be very shortly taken out of the hands of humans. And I don't agree with you, uh, Sir Roger, when you sort of say it's still the human element, because I think that when 
what we've tried to do ever since the end of the World War II is to basically limit the conduct of war or limit the conduct of, of conflict. But if you have someone who's sitting somewhere 3,000 or 6,000 kilometers or miles away pressing a machine to direct a robot or direct a, a, an autonomous weapon, against an unseen enemy that might be a target but not a person. I find that that is a very different experience from actually being on the battlefield. And the other problem that I have with this is that when you look at all of these, you know, games that are coming out, whether it's invasions or something, you know, there are these robots and they stretch out a hand and they have like a little, uh, uh, you know, weapon and it immediately kills people. And that means there is a desensitization of what it actually means to, to have a war, to have a battle. And that I find very dangerous because it makes war something that's costless other than an economic cost, but not a human cost. And that's really where it's going. And I find that that really needs to be addressed. And I can come back later on on what actually is happening on addressing it and how I see the way forward. Thank you. Uh, Ellen, um, you have been involved in robotic, robots and ethics, which isn't something people necessarily put together for a very long time. Um, sure. Uh, sum up how you see the ethical challenges here. Sure. Um, the, uh, so. I mean, the first thing I should say is that I, I was one of the signatories of, of, the, of the open letter, so I, I strongly support the, uh, the work of the International Campaign for Robot Arms Control. Um, there are clearly um, huge ethical implications, um, as well as technical objections, and I think you know, Sir Rogers already alluded to some of the technical problems, but we'll perhaps return to the technical problems, but staying with the ethical, um, essentially, if you give a weapon the ability to decide when to fire, when to pull the trigger, if you like, then you're giving the robot or the AI system moral agency. And, um, and the problem is, of course, you don't need to think very long about moral agency to, to know that uh, with, with moral agency comes responsibility. Now, um, uh, you know, we adult humans are all full moral agents. Now, we cannot build an artificial full moral agent, and probably won't, I'm sure, uh, Stuart, you'll agree with me, probably won't for, in my view, for hundreds of years. I mean, some, some AI uh, people, are, are, you know, colleagues are more optimistic than that, but, but the point is that uh, we simply cannot build uh, a robot or an AI system uh, that has moral agency. So for me, there's a kind of ethical red line, which is, you know, going from uh, human, uh, humans being ultimately responsible for, uh, for pulling the trigger and robots. And I think we should not, we cannot cross that red line. This gives me a chance to actually pull up some, I'm now queuing verbally the, magic, the magicians who are somewhere who are going to um, pull up the results of our first, there it is, like magic. If your country was suddenly at war, would you rather be defended by the sons and daughters of your community or by an autonomous AI weapon system? Well, this isn't that surprising, um, but the, perhaps the margin is. This, is this in the room, or is this um, beyond the room? I'm guessing this is in the room. This is the room. This is the room, OK. And is there a broader poll that you could also show us on the same question that was taken over? Yeah, well, closer. Interesting. Yeah, that's surprising. Now, I think we turn this question around uh, uh, in the next version. Uh, of, of, of the, of the where if your country was suddenly at war, would you rather be defended? This is, this is the honor. Can we have the, the question that follows? And while you get that up, can they be invaded? This is the turned around version. OK. You can show us the results from in the room now. <laughs> or maybe you can't. An autonomous system is not in charge of this. <laughs> this is still in charge. A human system is still in charge. Well, if they get it up, we'll talk about it. But it goes to the question, I think, of how people feel about are beginning to wrestle with it. Um, can I go back to what you were saying about, um, that's definitely not a poll result. Um, what, what were you saying about how, what, what would have to change in, in the way we actually um, work through uh, the kind of bans we've worked through on chemical and biological and, in fact, nuclear testing? Is there anything like a framework for that to, to make know, it, Stewart's ban come true? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, 
basically what, what happens is that uh, you have to have an international debate. And my concern is really that this international debate is so slow and it needs to be invigorated you know, by you know, the scientists, but it also needs to be helped by the industry because the industry is an extremely important player. And you asked me about the chemical weapons uh, uh, part. Yeah. And the chemical weapons is very interesting. It's the first treaty that was really elaborated with the involvement of the industry. It's never happened before because it was always somehow the monopoly of the, of the states who really negotiated that. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Chemical Weapons Treaty is a success. So I'm all in favor of bringing in various stakeholders into this debate, not only to inform some of the member states who are a little bit, let's say, not as advanced in their knowledge about these issues, but also to bring them into the loop. Because what you don't want is you don't want a treaty that only gets signed and ratified by, let's say, 60% or 75% of the member states, but that rather gets to have more a universal uh, uh, membership. Now, what is the mechanism for doing this? And as, as was said, is in Geneva there's a group and that meets under this convention, the CCW convention, and what it was is it basically it deals with issues that somehow fall outside of the scope of some other treaties. And we have a huge body of laws that have been developed. I mean, you know, think about the Geneva Protocols, for example. All of that was developed after the Second World War. You have an additional protocol. And so you have these additional protocols that have been signed by member states, and they are largely enforced. And even if the member states didn't ratify, very often by signing them, they agree to the moral obligation of observing them, for example. And that's extremely important. And um, there is actually, under Article 36 of the Geneva Convention, now the US has signed it, but not ratified. But what what it says, and I, I would like to read it because it's really important, because what it basically says is, in the study, development, acquisition, or adoption of a new weapon, means, or method of warfare, a high contracting party, i.e. a state, is under an obligation to determine whether its employment would be prohibited by this protocol or by any other rule of international law applicable to the member state. That's extremely important. Now, not every member state has signed it. A large number of states have signed it as a, or ratified it. The US has signed it. And so they do their own, let's say, a study and assessment of how, for example, robotic war, uh, uh, autonomous weapons would function. But they're not obliged to be transparent about this. So what you need to do is bring together these stakeholders, scientists, uh, industry, and particularly member states, and then look at where are we with international humanitarian law? What do we need in order to get something to address this? That's the first step. Do we even have a, uh, a definition of a, of a laws, of a mm -hmm. legal autonomous weapon system that we can all agree on? And I wouldn't spend too much time on the definition because you get mired down in, 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 in language and, and so forth. But on the other hand, under this convention that I mentioned, there is a possibility to add a protocol because already by the time there are new weapons that were invented, think of cluster munitions, right. uh, think of uh, other weapons, you can add another protocol that only applies to that. So you already got the framework. Yeah, right. And I think that that's the way to go. But you need to get everyone around the table. It needs to bring together a kind of a gelling of the stakeholders. And that, again, includes not only member states, but particularly scientists as well as the industry. Stuart. Yeah, so it's worth mentioning, I think, that as part of the internal review that Angela mentioned, the United States actually decided that autonomous weapons could not satisfy the laws of war. Uh, and they have an official policy uh, beginning in 2012, which runs for 10 years, which disallows the design and production of autonomous weapons. Uh, so they require that appropriate levels of human judgment be involved in every single attack uh, against humans. So the US is in fact, despite uh, its leadership in this technology, uh, and despite the fact that most other nations are to some extent terrified of, uh, of the United States technological abilities in this area, uh, is the only country that uh, has actually banned these, these weapons uh, as part of its armed forces. Uh, so from the US point of view, it would seem relatively straightforward and desirable that this ban should be extended to all the other countries that might potentially be enemies at, at some point um, so that uh, we don't risk uh, having a strategic deficit. So Roger, I was going to ask you a question, if you could, for first a technical one, then a sort of more political one. Um, for those of us who aren't knee deep in defense procurement, um, uh, is this technology most advanced in air rather than sea and land, I presume, I'm guessing, but I don't know, or maybe that's, that's not true. 
and I, then I was going to ask you, how does a defense procurement contractor manage a situation where the technology is running so far ahead of the protocols, or at least the apparent protocols, to manage and oversee it? OK. Well, from a technological point of view, I mean, there are levels of sophistication, you know, on land, sea, and air. And certainly, you know, it is a matter of record that in the air, the type of unmanned aircraft that are available now are very sophisticated and able to learn from their own experience. So that's moved on a long way. But there are shields that protect us from missile attacks, which use learning technology. So there is a level of capability that exists. It, it does not exist, to my knowledge, in the fully autonomous weapon that has been under discussion. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to make a couple of points, if I may, just picking up the points. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, I am the chairman of a company that manufactures equipment. I am not an advocate of this type of equipment, nor is my company. And. Uh, as a human being, uh, I mean, I share all the concerns of an autonomous system, which I think, you know, removes all sense of moral and ethical concern from war, which in itself is a difficult issue, mm -hmm. to a level that is almost incomprehensible. So I, I want to be very clear about that. I, I, I do believe that what we have seen as we move towards certain types of robot is an extension of the distancing of a combatant one from another. And your point about you know, the risk of desensitizing, I mean, I completely agree with. But that is what's happened over hundreds of years. I mean, the thought of soldiers in arm-to-arm -arm combat with swords is somehow much more concerning than with rifles. And the separation of man from the actual experience of killing is something that's been going on for many years. This is an extension of it. Mm -hmm. It is important that governments draw the line where we move into territory where, frankly, we risk becoming the architects of destruction, but simply spectators on the event. And that's not good for anybody. So your point about the engagement of weapon manufacturers I think is absolutely valid. And I think there is a complete understanding that lines need to be drawn. We all recognize that even when they are drawn, chemical warfare, cluster bombs, others will use those and seek to use those. So the rules aren't an end to the problem. It, it is human beings that both create the problem and are the problem because their pursuit of power and territory will reach out for any weapon at their disposal. We have to be very careful those weapons aren't provided to the wrong people with the wrong ambitions. And my question about the challenges of managing uh, a little bit for just a company where uh, the protocols don't always keep pace with the technology, or? I, I, for me, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, th th there's no industry more regulated than the industry I'm part of. And there's no company that acknowledges and obeys the regulation more than we do. Others, I'm sure, do the same, but certainly no more. And within the organization, we have ethical judgments that are made as to what we will and won't do, even within the bounds of so-called legal acceptability. So th there is an opportunity for management to exercise judgment and to draw a line in the sand, but always within the framework of international law and the disciplines that go with the challenges of being a weapons manufacturer. Alan, I was going to ask you, if you're being attacked, does it matter whether the weapon is autonomous or not? Um, yes, it does profoundly matters. In fact, uh, that's perhaps an opportunity for me to reflect on the results that we just saw. And if I, if I recall correctly, I think that the poll said something like 80% odd um, would prefer to send uh, AI systems to war than, than people. and almost the opposite um, in terms of being attacked. And you know, with very great respect to, 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 you know, to colleagues around the room, uh, it reveals an extraordinary uh, confidence, um, a misplaced, misguided confidence in AI systems. Uh, the, you know, I've, I've been building real robots uh, for 20 some years, 
And as soon as you take a, a robot, even a well-designed robot, and put it in a chaotic environment, it behaves chaotically. In other words, it makes mistakes. Uh, so you know, it's very important to understand that, that, that uh, you know, the current state of the art and, and in the, the, you know, the relatively near future. That sounds very human, by the way. Absolutely, yes. I mean, the, the, the more um, we put robots into a, uh, a, a, an unstructured, a chaotic right. environment, that, that includes the home. I mean, I'm right. not just talking right. about the battlefield. The battlefield is just an extreme version of this. So, um, you know, robots, we, I, I do an enormous amount of public engagement. One of the things that I try and, and help people to understand is just how poor, how weak our technology is. And, and you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the press and media have play a part in, in hyping up the technology. Of course, it's, you know, it's, it, it's exciting to see headlines about, um, you know, when will robots take over the world and stuff like that. But, but the truth is that, they're, you know, they're, they're not smart enough and, and will not be for a very long time even to be able to, to do the kind of things that we're talking about. Well, as you know, I have to say, I disagree <laughs> profoundly uh, with that. Uh, so, so what parts do we need, right? We need the ability to perceive and maneuver. Uh, we know that self-driving cars now have extremely accurate perception of their environments. They can detect moving vehicles. They can find people, uh, buildings. Uh, equipped with, you know, you, you can buy a four ounce radar that can look through walls and find human beings inside buildings. Um, so uh, the ability to maneuver quickly through streets and inside buildings has already been demonstrated for quadcopters. Uh, the tactical decision making, when was the last time you beat the world's best chess computer? You know, I don't want to play chess against computers. They, they, they are... F they are as far beyond the best human as the best human is beyond me. Um, so, uh, and the physical platforms are uh, really, really accelerating in their capabilities. Uh, you know, you can have a, uh, a drone that I can carry in my hand uh, can cross the Atlantic without refueling. Um, so the physical capabilities, the tactical capabilities, and the perception control, they're all there. Uh, and when I talk to my colleagues who build uh, quadcopter control systems for a living, they say, you know, if we had a Manhattan-style project within 18 months to two years, we could deploy these in the tens of millions. Uh, and they could be used to go into cities to find uh, people of a certain characteristic. So this is not just like a nuclear weapon that kills everyone. We can kill all males between the age of 12 and 60. Uh, we can even distinguish by what clothing they're wearing as to whether we want to kill them. Uh, so this is something that is not decades in the future. We're not talking about systems that have to be as intelligent as humans. We're not talking about systems that are in the business of taking over the world. They're in the business of carrying out the instructions that humans give them. Uh, and if humans choose to give them instructions to wipe out all males in a certain city, uh, they can do that. I'm, I, I'm just, just can I make one, one observation? I mean, I, I think the point you make that this is such a rapidly developing field and things that we regard as pretty normal today, even five years ago, we would have found quite extraordinary. I think we also have to respect the fact that, that good ideas are not the preserve of good people. Mm. And because of that, we have to draw the distinction, I think, between finding the rules by which people are supposed to live by but ensuring we do not allow ourselves to become at risk from people with good ideas but bad objectives. I was going to open this question to everyone, but uh, it's a so, version. So let me just respond okay. very quickly. Yes. Uh, as far as I know, no one is proposing a ban on weapons that can kill drones. Drones don't carry humans, and so killing them is not a lethal act. So defensive anti-drone weapons, absolutely, I think we should develop them. Yes. But if manufacturers are producing these weapons in the millions, uh, then bad actors will have access to them. I think it's very difficult for ISIS, for example, to develop their own indigenous capability to manufacture millions of extremely effective miniaturized intelligent drones. I think that would be uh, easily detected and, and we could put them out of business. The definition of bad people does move around, of course. Yeah. Um, um, but coming back to Angela's point about the collaboration of industry, um, in the Chemical and uh, Weapons Convention, uh, it's really important because of the ease of taking ordinary industrial chemicals uh, and applying them to, uh, to weapons. 
Uh, and so they keep track of precursor chemicals and they make sure they're not selling them to the wrong people and so on. This is essential and I think we might have to look at the same kinds of measures for people who are making ordinary commercial drones, which are uh, wonderful technology. Uh, they have all kinds of uh, uses, both for services to individuals and humanitarian goals and so on. Um, but I think it's possible to work with them to make sure that they're, uh, they're not diverted to the wrong purposes. They can be GPS limited, so they can only stay in certain regions and so on. Now, you know, there's an old arms controller f f uh, expression, you know, that uh, uh, chemical weapons were sometimes referred to as the poor man's nuke. You know, it was, there was a low... Biology was worse. Well, biology was worse. Yes. So that is, is uh, and this technology is cost a barrier to entry, because of course, as uh, Saraja said, it's one thing if it's you know seven Western, Western countries that have this technology. It's quite another if it's something that anyone can build in their backyard or in their basement. So uh, does that enter into this and it's our ability to regulate it? No, or it is. It? And I think that what we have to say, and I think Saraja said it before, there are very good uses for automated systems and you know ID control or mine clearance or something. There's a lot of it that's being used underwater, for example. But on the other hand, I think that uh, what we also need to look at is that when you look at, for example, a nuclear weapon, it's not that easy to make a nuclear weapon because you have to get hold of the materials. I think that with robots or drones or whatever it is, with autonomous Swiss systems, the entry level is much lower. It's much easier to manufacture that. And that, to me, is the greatest concern. And that, to me, is, and I say at the example of, for example, the drones, which are fairly recent. I mean, how long ago did we start drones? I mean, you know, maybe not even that. The first World War. Well, okay, well, okay fine, fine. fine. Sorry, but I mean, you know, it's accelerated to such an extent over the last 10, 15 years that I am concerned that this development is just accelerating. I mean, you were talking about the fourth industrial revolution, the fast development of technology, and that's just part of it. So we must make sure it doesn't get into the, hand of the yes. wrong, hands of the wrong people or that it is applicable in terms of being able to reciprocate. I mean, we already have 3D printing. You know, people are printing their guns, etc. It's just a matter of programming it. And that's really what concerns me. And that's why I think we need to get industry in there. We need to have larger stakeholders. And I really tried to get member states to focus on this. I mean, starting, you know, after with Christoph Haynes, we had this big consultation. But it's only started in 2014. And there hasn't been that much progress. And there needs to be more progress. Can I say to you that I think one of the big challenges, and, and it's true of anything that is in high technology, whether it's cyber or whether it's this kind of automated system, the people who have the job of making the judgment as to whether it should be something we legislate for very often do not have a full understanding of where we are That's in the exactly process it. and the risk exactly it. and how close it is to being a reality. Exactly. So there's an education process required for those that become the legislators, which is, I think, all our responsibilities mm -hmm. such that we can create an environment which is at least controlled, although we know we're heading towards creation of machinery that is very dangerous indeed. Mm -hmm. We're going to open. The, oh, please, open. I was just going to say we're going to open the question uh, audience up to question. Uh, open the panel up to questions from the audience. Um, so be ready, because. Uh, uh, so I mean, I absolutely agree, Angela. The the the, the cost of entry is very low now, and, and you can you know when you can buy a, a, a an autopilot for a, a small flying thing for a you know fifty dollars or something, and it's really quite a good autopilot. But but I you know where I and here I'm I I feel compelled to come back on on uh, Stuart's um, disagreement. Um, the, the, yes, I mean, you know, I, I, I do agree with you that you could build systems uh, now which are pretty indiscriminate. But I think discrimination is much harder. So, so you know, I'd argue with you that we cannot, in fact, build systems that can uh, really dis distinguish between a combatant and a non-combatant. In fact, we don't even have a, a good definition of what a, a non-combatant is. Yeah, I mean, um, we could get it right 60% of the time, 70% of the time. Um, and don't forget, you know, so self-driving cars need to be eight nines, so 99.999999% reliable, uh, right? You can't afford to make one mistake even every 10 years of driving. Uh, 
do you think ISIS needs their drones to be that reliable in terms of discriminating civilians from soldiers? No. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, so, uh, and, and in general in warfare, our systems are nothing like that, that reliable. Uh, you know, bo unexploded bombs litter London even now from the, from the Second World War. Uh, so, so I think 80% you know, is pretty good for military equipment. Um, so I think that would be very uh, easily achievable uh, with present day technology. Okay, so now this is your chance. Um, uh, uh, I know there's a uh, microphone. Two microphones. Please identify yourself. Hi, uh, Sue Chan from The Telegraph in London. This is one for Sir Roger. You spoke in very plain terms about the need to draw lines in the sand on these sort of weapons. I mean, in your lifetime, do you ever see a fully autonomous weapon rolling off the production lines of BAE? And what are you going to do to ensure this technology doesn't get into the wrong hands? Well, the one thing I've learned in my lifetime so far is the danger of making a prediction. <laughs> um, what I would say is this, that you know, the company, first and foremost, only operates within absolute laws and government guidelines of requirement. It does not choose what it makes or what it does, first. Second, at this time, the company has a strong belief, as does the government, that the separation of decision-making from equipment, the removal of the human, is fundamentally wrong. And therefore, the only development we are doing, and indeed intend to do, is against that definition. For all the reasons that have been said by people who have never met before, or I'd never met before, you know, there is a common belief amongst human beings that to allow machines to choose where to fight, what to fight, how to fight, and to liberate weapons is a very dangerous thing to do. And I think as human beings, until that sense of risk changes in people's minds, nobody will want to do that. What we have to do is to make sure that this development stays mainly in the hands of people with the right motives and does not stray into the hands of people who don't have those kind of moral convictions or concerns. Yes, here in the front row. Uh, Tony West from the United States, and it's been an interesting conversation. I will say there is a sense of inevitability to whether or not these uh, uh, systems will be uh, actually developed and whether or not they will stay in the right hands. But my question is really one about deterrence value and asking if you all could comment on that. It can be argued that as terrible as nuclear weapons can be, uh, their existence whether you agree with the Strategic Defense Initiative or not, its existence created a deterrence context which kept the peace. Uh, and so is there an argument that uh, perhaps the United States is wrong to be the only country saying that we shouldn't develop these weapons? Maybe the answer is more of, uh, since, since others are developing these weapons, why not develop these weapons such that the existence of them uh, might create a deterrence value? Your thoughts on that? Alan? <laughs> uh, wow, that's a, that's a really tough question. Um, uh, I think perhaps the, you know, part of the answer has already been given, which is that uh, you know, the, the, the cost of entry is so low to this technology that, that actually uh, it's absurd to think it could be a deterrent. You know, if you're, if you're uh, suggesting uh, uh, you know, that, that we should develop something which which deters others uh, when, it's, when it's so readily um, developable, developable, you know, could be developed. Um, I, so I'm, I, I think my, my short answer is no. Yeah, so I just come back to the point that uh, defensive anti-drone weaponry, uh, anti-missile uh, systems are currently legal and they're not uh, proposed to be banned uh, because they don't kill humans. Uh, and I think the U.S. has been, uh, for more than a decade now, uh, holding competitions to see if we can develop systems that can uh, destroy these drones. It turns out they're extremely difficult uh, to shoot down when they're very small and they go quite fast. Uh, current air defense systems have a really hard time with them. So, um, 
So I think that uh, technological development would, will continue. Um, but they're really, uh, as, as offensive systems, I mean, so deterrence means if you do this to us, we will do this to you. Uh, as offensive systems, um, they're not particularly effective uh, at deterrence because I, the, the kinds of systems we're talking about uh, have uh, their greatest effect against undefended uh, civilian populations, for example. And I don't think the US is prepared uh, to launch that kind of attack, even if, uh, you know, as happened in 9-11, the U.S. suffers a significant attack on its population centers, I don't think we're going to go and then say, okay, fine, uh, let's take some random city in the Middle East and wipe out its population. Uh, that's not going to happen. I can debate for a long time the uh, deterrent or rather non-deterrent effects of nuclear weapons, but that's not the forum here today. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, I think that uh, what we need to look at also is that the entrance to this technology is very low, and it's not going to remain in the hands of those states or those companies that currently have it. I mean, this is basically what we have seen, and that's what we really need to deal with. And I would like to see, and Stuart already mentioned uh, that the U.S. has actually a Defense Department uh, rule uh, that they have, uh, I think, 2012 or 2013. And I would like to see the United States taking a much higher profile. I mean, who took the initiative among the member states to actually put this on the table? That was France. That's now being continued by Germany. Uh, but on the other hand, I would like to see those countries and those stakeholders who actually have knowledge about this and who can do the education, as Sir Roger said, very important, to take the lead in all of this, to basically elevate the debate on this. Because it is right now, it is seen as something, something positive in a way by many people. And that I find very dangerous. Yeah, the, the, the myth that uh, somehow if we wanted to have a war, we would just have our robots fight each other. Uh, and then when the robots had finished fighting, we would say, OK, so we lost. Uh, great. OK, so we lost. That means that uh, you can take all our women, uh, you can take all our wealth, and we will be slaves for the rest of time to your country because uh, our robots lost. Come on, guys. We could play baseball. Uh, and right. decide that we right. lost and therefore you can enslave our population. This is just not how things work. Uh, the con a country gives in when the human cost of continuing the war becomes unacceptable, when the government can no longer in any reasonable way guarantee the safety of its people. That's when a war ends, uh, is when I, I it's agree. basically, you know, you're putting your hands up or you're dead. I, I agree uh, with that. And, and so this, this idea of robot-only warfare is just a complete red herring. But it's a game. It's a game. Uh, I mean, well, everyone but, but, has but It's interesting. That, yeah, that's right. The next level is a video game. And, and the works, trouble is that for most people, these things start to fuse right. when they think about it. The, the point I would make just about the deterrent, I, I think the nuclear deterrent, and, and I, I accept we would have a separate debate on that, but I think is effective because of the scale of destruction that it offers and that we have still the evidence of what a, a very extreme attack can do from the Second World War on millions of people. And that's so vivid in people's minds it, it acts as a deterrent. The trouble with the robot conversation is people stray to the video game or the Star Wars movie. It doesn't feel the same, yet it is just as dangerous and potentially lethal in a different way. But it doesn't feel like that. And that's why when the panel voted, there was no concern about putting robots to war because somehow it didn't feel a terribly dangerous thing to do. We haven't seen it yet. So um, there's a clause, one of the protocols of the Geneva Conventions, called the Martins Clause, which says that uh, at all times the human person will remain under the protection of the dictates of public conscience. So uh, if you think about that photograph of the small Syrian boy lying drowned on the beach and what effect that had on the, the policy of the European Union countries. Now imagine that instead of drowning, that boy was being chased along the beach by a quadcopter, which gets into position and then blows off his head. And then you see that little boy lying on the beach with his head missing. Uh, what is that going to do? Right? What is public conscience going to say at that point? Right? The public conscience says, oh, yeah, this is just war. This is how it works. Or are they going to say, we crossed a moral line that we should never even have approached, um, that we should never give the decision to kill humans to a machine, uh, and the decision to kill humans is a heavy moral responsibility 
that we have to reserve for ourselves and we have to take responsibility for it. Uh, I don't think there's any question what would happen uh, after that point, but of course then it would be too late. Then the weapons have already right. proliferated uh, and defense uh, postures of many countries already incorporated autonomous weapons uh, into how they operate. Uh, and it's very hard to reverse at that point. We have time for one more question. I was really struck by your use of the word game and how you echoed it, um, Roger, because I, uh, sometime between Christmas and about, I would say, the 10th of January in the US, the FAA asked all Americans who had a drone to register them. And the number was something like 189,000 in 12 days or 15 days? And fast growing. And yeah. fast growing. And of course, not everyone has registered their drone or drones. <laughs> so that told me that there is a talk about that's, of course, not an autonomous weapon. Um, but it does suggest a fascination with the technology that is somewhat beyond the, uh, the expert level. We have a question here in the second row, if you can. Yeah. Hang on. My, uh, my question is. Identify yourself, please. That um, if you, if I listen to all of you, you have the feeling that you know borders are crossed. So maybe one of the actions the country should take that they ban all the video games or you know stuff where fighting is just normal. Well, we're past. I think you can. I, I think your question is: Is there some way to regulate rather right. than ban? Maybe you should just ban all these games where people get desensitized. Uh, desensitized well, by, the the the, you know? uh, the economic the uh, forums a session on banning video games, um, which I'm not in charge of, should be on the list perhaps for tomorrow or next year. But uh, I'm not sure we're <laughs> well, capable tell, of dealing with know, it today. Is, no, no. But the conclusion here is that you know you're all worried about the fact that people might cross a line yeah, uh, because they are desensitized mm -hmm. um, and therefore uh, that might be a plan yeah, to raise this issue in, in the public even more so that maybe some action is taken there. It's a food chain. Yes, I think public awareness uh, is very important. So when we published a letter in July, there were over 2,000 media articles uh, describing the letter and its contents. Uh, the Financial Times uh, main editorial uh, said uh, that we have to avoid this nightmarish future. That was the word uh, in the headline of the editorial. Uh, so some people took notice, and that was good. But there are still a lot of people who didn't hear about it. Um, and there, if you, if you mention killer robots or autonomous weapons, their only exposure is the Terminator robot. Um, and uh, you know, when, when, we, when we look at Terminator robots, they are large, slow-moving, heavy, vulnerable, and incredibly inaccurate. They shoot hundreds of bullets without hitting anybody. Uh, <laughs> come on, guys, get real. The robots we're talking about, when they shoot a bullet, it will hit its target. Um, so we're, think we're thinking about uh, systems that, that weigh less than an ounce, uh, that can fly faster than a person can run. Uh, and can blow holes in their heads with one gram of shape charge explosive um, and can be launched in the millions. So, so being attacked by an army of Terminators is, is a piece of cake compared to uh, being attacked by this kind of weapon. And perhaps the protocol has to extend beyond the weapon systems themselves. Can we go to the, this last uh, two, two, two down. Thank you, Bigley, Switzerland. I see two trends. On one side, we have mass effect weapon, and on the other side we have extremely pinpoint individual weapon. And probably in future, one will need something which is in between. The real war will be try to target as much as possible, but at the same time, there should be a certain scale of effect. Uh, because if uh, there are big wars, uh, the efficiency will imply something which is more than just a few pinpoint people. So where do you see the future between less than the nuclear weapon, less than the very mass uh, destruction effect, and the very individual pinpoint targeted? Well, that range of weaponry exists today. And you know, it can be taken from you know, a very simple pistol all the way through to a very pinpoint accurate missile which can take out a moving target with absolute precision. It's very expensive, but it reduces collateral damage. 
you know, uh, over a period, each level of weaponry has been developed but they are all have the common denominator of only being unleashed by a human being. And that is still the line in the sand. Final thoughts. Um, Let me just add something, and I find it very interesting because we have used consistently the term war. Now, it used to be that wars were declared among member states. You haven't had a declaration of war among member states, I think, since the Second World War. 50, yeah, so it's really, it's really incorrect to speak about war. And we speak about war on terrorism and monotony, yeah. but it really is conflict. And that I find also very dangerous in a way, because we're looking at it as something that's very limited. Yeah. You know, it's something that is, is defined maybe by a geographic scope or maybe by a certain mm. other consideration. Mm. But it's not really a conflagration. It's not really something that is a large scale something. And that's why those miniaturized weapons, including including now what we're looking at is, for example, nuclear weapons that are being miniaturized, if you so want, very dangerous. Because what it means is that uh, you're not setting off a world war, but you're setting off something that is much smaller, and therefore it makes the temptation to use it much, much uh, more, more easier to, to do that for, for, for commanders and leaders. Right, and that's part of the thing that is accelerating so broad, quickly that you talked about at the top. So I think we have uh, a fairly short time horizon to act. Uh, if something doesn't happen within the next uh, two years in terms of uh, essentially drawing all the main parties into a serious negotiation, uh, what's called the group of government experts where uh, the nations contribute uh, experts who will write out the technical details of the treaties. If this process does not get underway within the next couple of years, uh, it may be too late. I agree with that. Alan, you get the last. Um, so, I mean, I'm delighted that the, the panelists are, are essentially in broad agreement about the uh, the, the uh, unwisdom, the, uh, uh, the the you know the danger, the danger, yes, of of um, autonomous robot weapons. So, what I would invite, you know, if if the audience members and those people who are watching on TV agree with us, then please write to your uh, your representative, your member of parliament, whoever it is. Um, and, and tell them that, because I think this is something that, that our policymakers need to, you know, need to know. They need to, to, to know from us that it's, it's you know, we the people, that, that it's something that uh, is not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Sir Roger. Angelo? Stuart? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll be here getting ourselves together for a little while if you want to come up and talk. Thank, Thank you. you.